My name is Paul Charnier. I'm the editorial page editor of the Day newspaper, and I welcome you to tonight's debate, which is being uh, broadcast live on theday.com from Fitch High School. Um, before we get started, I, I wanted to uh, note the passing of a couple of uh, great women. Uh, New London uh, awoke today to learn of the passing of Jane Glover. Uh, Jane was very prominent in the African-American community in our region uh, and in civic and political life, uh, including serving as mayor of the council in New London. Um, also, uh, uh, I learned today of the passing of Judy Dolphin. Uh, Judy was a longtime leader with the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut. In fact, just um, a few weeks ago, I was talking with her of uh, planning for elite participation and timekeepers for our debates like this one, but unfortunately, Judy suffered a terrible fall uh, and a serious uh, head injury, and I learned of her passing today. So if I could ask just for uh, a brief moment of silence for these uh, uh, two wonderful women. Thank you. So again, welcome to the 18th District uh, Senate debate. The district includes the towns of Griswold, Rotten, North Stonington, Plainfield, Preston, Sterling, Stonington, and Voluntown. I'd like to thank the uh, Rotten Board of Education and Superintendent Dr. Grainer for the use of these facilities. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, uh, the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut. And a special thanks to the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut, who, as always, uh, despite the rough day they're having, uh, are here as well to provide our timekeepers. Uh, the participants uh, for tonight's debate, uh, the Republican candidate, uh, Senator Heather Summers. Democratic candidate Bob Statue. Um, okay, I'm glad you got that on your system. Because at this point going forward, I'm going to ask you to be respectful. Uh, if not for me, for Judy Dolphin, she was a real stickler for audience decorum. So I, I would ask you to, to um, you know, be quiet, uh, uh, you know, no comments, no applause during uh, the debate itself while the candidates are answering the question, the time should be theirs, um, and certainly we can all applaud uh, when we get to the end. So uh, with that, we were going to begin our debate, just a, a couple of comments on the format. Uh, the candidates will get one minute openings and closings. Uh, and then during the course of the debate, questions will uh, go back and forth between the candidates. Uh, we'll have uh, a chance uh, to respond to every question. Uh, so with that, um, we begin uh, by a flip of the coin. Uh, Mr. Statchin uh, is the first to give his opening statement. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And thanks to the League of Women Voters for hosting this, uh, as you've done throughout the district and, and all the races around. Um, it's because this is an important race as well. This election is about trust. Who do you trust with your children's education, your family's health care, and your own financial security? Who do you trust to make sure you can live with dignity in retirement? I think there's a really clear choice. At the federal level, Republicans have passed tax cuts that have primarily benefited the rich and are driving up the national deficit to at least $1.5 trillion. At the state level, the Republican-led budget in September 2017 would have slashed investment in education, health care, economic development, 
while again cutting taxes primarily for the wealthiest families. So you need to know my values. After 26 years in the Air Force and the Connecticut Air National Guard, I live by their core values. Integrity first, service before self, and excellence in everything you do. I believe education is the key to success, and I will work to make sure education funding is fairly applied in our district. I believe healthcare is a moral right, and I will work to make sure that everyone can be covered by a real healthcare plan, regardless of pre-existing conditions. And I believe fair economic development can create social and economic justice for our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Summers. Yes, good evening, and thank you all for being here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters, and thank you to the day for putting on this debate. My name is Heather Summers, and I am the current senator from the 18th District. I have deep roots here in Connecticut. I'm not somebody who summered here. I grew up here. I graduated from this very high school. My father and my mother taught me the value of hard work, honesty, independence, and always doing the morally right thing. When I graduated from high school, I went to work at Electric Boat, some of the best people still to this day that I'm still friends with. After that, I went into the medical field and eventually started my own company in 1997 a high-tech, biotech company where we had to be resourceful, tenacious, and never give up. We patented a technology that is used across the globe today, and I'm happy to say it has contributed nearly $70 million to the state coffers. This election is about the state of Connecticut. It is not about Washington. We have seen now the eight years of the failed policies of the Malloy administration has led us to the bottom of all the economic indicators. And I look forward to answering questions tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we'll begin the uh, question. Um, uh, just for the candidates, uh, the timekeepers will hold up 15 second time when you have 15 seconds left so you can begin to wrap up your response. Um, uh, Mr. Statchin, um, your campaign mailers uh, keep referring to, quote, Hotford politician Heather Summers. But aren't you, by definition, also a politician running to go to Hotford? So I wonder, what is the point? So I, I think my concern is that um, Senator Summers has, has voted 98% of the time with the Republican leadership. Um, yes, I am, I am looking to go to Hartford. Um, I'm hoping to bring a new spirit to Hartford. Um, I'm hoping to bring a bipartisan spirit um, where people can cross lines and, and work together. Um, I think that, that having a voting record clearly showing that, that most of the time you're going to be um, voting with what the Republican leadership says is not beneficial um, and also is of concern because I think the, you know, when we have a Republican candidate for governor who's looking to cut the income tax by, uh, by you know, eliminate the income tax, um, to have a, then a Senate that is going to be able to implement that I think is dangerous and, and I, just, I think it's a, an economic policy that I don't agree with um, and therefore I, I think that we can look for other solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, your response, Senator uh, Summers, yeah, 90 seconds. Okay, absolutely. So my opponent says that I voted with the Republicans 98% of the time. What he doesn't seem to understand is that the majority of the bills have passed in a bipartisan uh, way. So they go on what's called consent. So if you want to double down on the numbers, you can look at it and say, I voted with Democrats and Republicans 90% of the time. So let's be clear about that. As far as the governor candidate, Bob, uh, Bob Stefanowski, I have made it clear, I am not someone who believes that we can eliminate the income tax. But let me tell you this, if we can reduce taxes and put more money in people's pockets, it helps spur the economy. We've seen that with some of the legislation that I passed. I was an advocate to pass lowering the boat tax, not mega yachts, but boats that middle class families use. The, the average cost is $20,000. We had no boat sales. We had lost 17,000 boat sales to Rhode Island. This year, since July, since I've been able to get the tax down from 6.35 to 2.99, we've seen a 48% increase in boat sales. That spurs the economy. We can buy a boat here, you keep it here, you have it maintained here. So that's what we need to be looking at. The other candidate for governor, what you're not hearing is he wants a second house tax. He wants a second tax, a statewide property tax on your cars. So do we want to continue with the failed policies of Malloy and go with Lamont and Mr. Statchin, or do we want to do something different and save Connecticut? We've had 44 years of one-party rule in Connecticut that has destroyed our state. Uh, Mr. Statchin, another 30 seconds on this question. Sure. 
Um, first off, the, the, the voting record, yes, there is a lot of consent votes, and I'm aware of that, but when a candidate's entire premise of her campaign is challenging the status quo, um, I think that it is relevant that, that she actually has a 98% um, voting record, so it, it does cause question as to what the, what, what the challenging of the status quo actually consists of. Regarding the one-party rule, I think it's important to keep in mind there was a Republican governor for 16 years. Um, uh, since 2001, so I think that, uh, or I'm sorry, since, since 1991. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, begins with Senator Summers. Um, it's over here. Uh, a campaign mail approved by you uh, refers to your opponent as radical Professor Bob Statue. Why do you consider Mr. Statue to be a radical? Well, if you look at the policies that Mr. Statchin has put out on his uh, website before um, his, his running, he an opponent got out of the race, they are radical. He wants the government takeover of health care. He is for sanctuary cities. He has said on the radio that he would consider abolishing ICE. To me, pushing uh, politics to the hard left for political gain is radical. In fact, I'm in more in line with Dan Kelly, who was his opponent than I am with Mr. Statchin. So I stand by that definition. Uh, Mr. Statchin, you get 90 seconds to respond. Thank you. Um, this is good, because I think we can start talking about the issues, because I think um, you know the policies that I put forth on my website, and I, I stand by them 100%, um, have to do with economic development and economic growth and, and, and economic policies. Um, and, I, and I know that, that many of the policies that I've put forth um, increase minimum wage, implementing electronic tolls, stimulating regional um, service delivery. Um, all of these were also put forth by that radical Commission on Fiscal Stability and Economic Growth. Um, those are the policies that we're, we're, we're looking for. That's what we should be talking about. Um, you know, I've had top secret clearance in the, Air, in the, with the Department of Defense since 1990. I've had uh, top secret clearance since 1999. Um, you know, I, I can understand that there's not a lot out on there, uh, not a lot out there to, to critique as far as dirt in the political world, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't talk about the issues, um, that we can't say, gee, I don't agree that we should have a minimum wage. I don't agree that the, the health care should exempt pre-existing conditions. Let's talk about that, um, because I, I think, again, looking at, at various organizations around the state, my beliefs are in line with, with many of them and, and a lot of people who are actually looking for solutions um, rather than simply name calling. Thank you. And so the you got another 30 seconds to respond to what you heard. I only have 30 seconds? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, okay. Well, I find the government takeover of Medicaid to be radical. What would happen there is really the socialization of healthcare would lead to the rationing of healthcare. You'd have no doctors. You'd have um, people that were not able to get care, and the cost is close to $32 trillion. Mr. Stanton has all these ideas, but no way to pay for them. So instead of the radical takeover of health care, I think we should focus on what we can do bipartisanly to increase quality access to health care, which is what I've done as the chair of public health through things like telemedicine. I just received an award at Children's Hospital in the VA for life-saving um, medicine that we were able to bring together after years of not being able to get it across the finish line. Thank so that's you. what we need to do. Thank you. And just uh, to explain the format, the, uh, the candidate that gets the question gets 60 seconds, uh, the other candidate gets 90 to respond and rebut, and then back to the original candidate uh, for 30 seconds. Uh, Senator uh, Summers, um, what does Connecticut need to do to achieve the kind of job growth that has been seen in neighboring states? Well, that's a great question. It's hard to answer in 60 seconds, but quite frankly, we need to continue some of the things that we've been doing. I was an advocate of a workforce training program, SB 444, that I introduced with Paul Famica to help the workforce that we have here coming through, through all the work through Electric Boat. I also had a great apprenticeship bill that passed unanimously one of the 90% that I voted with Democrats for, and unfortunately, the, the governor vetoed that. The Republicans wanted to override that veto, but the Democrats wouldn't agree. They stood by the governor's side. We need to make sure that we change the landscape of Connecticut. We need to look at um, actually nurturing businesses that are here, cut through the regulatory tape. I can name four right off the top of my the tip of my tongue that are strangled by the regulations and the policies in Hartford that are limiting their ability to grow. Let's start with the businesses ha we have here to expand, 
We have to change the tax code and the way we deliver services. People are not going to invest in the state of Connecticut until we get our fiscal house in order. We have massive debt after 44 years of the Democratic legislature, who are the purse strings in Connecticut, not the governor, leading the Thank you. It's time to change that. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Satchin, uh, what ideas would you bring to achieve the kind of job growth uh, here in Connecticut that other neighboring states have seen? I think first, Connecticut has to remember how great it is and how we are a good state that, that has uh, many strengths. Um, we're number three in the, the U.S. for employees with advanced degrees, number four in the U.S. for private R&D investment, um, number two in the country for high-speed internet. We have many great qualities um, that we should be able to take advantage of. But let's talk about jobs and how we build jobs, because that, that's crucial. First, Connecticut's a leader in advanced manufacturing, known around the world for that. Um, the funding for job training at EB, which Senator uh, Austin came into the district and helped with, along with uh, Representative Conley and De La Cruz, put us on a track that we needed to do. And it's not just large EB, it's also their suppliers. I was up in uh, Plainfield with uh, uh, Ray Coombs at Westminster Tool, and he was saying, you know, he, and wonderful company, and, and building great things again, advanced manufacturing. And, and he said, you know what, people complain that there's not enough workers for these jobs and that's simply and he says you know what there are if we treat them fairly if we pay them fairly if we give them help if we provide health care that they can rely upon if we give them a fair wage so they can live in dignity and not have to have three or four jobs in order to support their family so i think advanced manufacturing health services is something that's crucial for this area and i know stonington's working on a project tourism um 14.7 billion dollar industry in connecticut eighty-three thousand jobs um, 1.7 billion in taxes. Um, just today, they announced they're going to have a blue ribbon, ribbon uh, program on tourism, and that, I, I think that's very encouraging. Thank you, uh, Senator Summers. Yes, um, I'm here listening to my opponent, and I would just like to say we are the lowest um, economic situation of any other state in the nation because of the policy of Dan Malloy and the Democrats for the past 44 years. That's the that's that's the bottom line. I just want to clarify something. Electric Boat decided to put $8 million into workforce training. It wasn't Senator Austin, and I don't believe Sen uh, uh, Representative Conley or Dela Cruz even visited with the President, because I was there with Verbeka, and they told us that. As far as tourism, I'm on the Tourism Caucus. We have advocated for a line item in the budget, because for every dollar that is spent on tourism, we get $3 back in the same year. Unfortunately, the Democrats and the Governor don't agree with that. Thank you. Uh, next question, Mr. Satchin. Um, with the Democrats in full control of the legislature and the governorship, uh, Connecticut saw two of the largest tax increases in state history. In the past two years, however, with the Senate split 1818, the legislature has largely held the line on taxes. What do you say to voters who are concerned that voting for you will return the Senate to the Democrats and result in more tax increases? I would say that probably the largest tax increase that we're about to experience in Connecticut is a result of the Republican president who's eliminated or reduced the um, state local tax deduction. So that's going to cost Connecticut taxpayers $2.8 billion. Um, so, so that is of concern, and, and that is reflective of what the policies will be. The, the Republican policies will be come in, cut the taxes on the rich, cut the taxes, and, and we'll all be fine. And you see that in, in the, the, the Republican, the, in the candidate Stefanowski's um, proposal. And I, I give Heather, Senator Summers credit for saying that she doesn't agree with that. Um, but at the end of the day, if we have a Republican governor and we have a Republican Senate, which is what the, the, the if, if that did happen, um, those are the type of policies that would be put in place those are the type of policies that I really don't believe in, and those are the type of policies which I think will hurt Connecticut tremendously. And that's, that's why I'm running. Thank you. So, as soon as you get 90 seconds. Yeah. Okay, if you elect my opponent, you will have tax increases. He wants tolls. For the average middle class person, that's going to be $2,700 to $3,400 a year that you're going to be paying out of your pocket. So, forget your property tax reduction. Let's talk about the priorities of the Republican Senate. The Democrats deleted things like the Rape Crisis Center, daycare for kids, funding for the disabled, food for the elderly. I, as the Chair of Appropriations in Health and Human Services, we each have our own portion, I made sure all of those things were fully funded. School-based health clinics, another one of the Governor and the Democrats' pet peeves to get rid of. The Republicans restored that. 
the Republicans made sure we had $2 million to fix the hospital for the veterans. And the Republicans added $70 million to the pool of education. The Democrats cut that. The Democrats wanted the tax that we call the teacher tax. They wanted the teacher's tax pushed down to the towns. That would have been a bill for the town of Stonington of $1.3 million, for the town of Rotten, $3.4 million. So let's talk about priorities. The Republican Senate has the right priorities. They're the priorities of the people, not of politics. Right, Mr. Statue, you have another 30 seconds on this question? I would again refer, as, as I have in the, in the past, to the Republican budget of 2017. And, and I, would, I would say that the cuts that were involved there in the irresponsible financial planning, um, as far as raising local property taxes by $660 million, um, ch changing or canceling 485 in bond authorizations. There were so many policies within there that would have been detrimental. And if, if you think that the Republicans would come in, cut the income tax by $11 billion, and then be on the lookout for and helping these social programs that are crucial to our people, then um, I think you need to really look close at, at the history of it. Thank you. Uh, next question to Senator Summers. Um, but does it bother you as a woman and as a Republican uh, when President Trump does such things as, in a political rally, make light of a woman's claims of sexual assault, or insults a woman who sued him as horse face, or labels a woman opponent with culturally insensitive names like Pocahontas? If so, why don't you speak out more? Yes, it does bother me. And it also bothers me when I hear Bob Statchett's supporters say things about my children. It bothers me. But as a politician, you have to have thick skin. I think it's wrong. I don't think anybody should call a woman a derogatory name. I wouldn't do that. I think it's wrong. The reason I haven't spoken out, let's talk about speaking out. I want to know where the Democrats were when I was the only one to speak out about the abuse at Whiting Forensic. I want to know where one Democrat was when I spoke out about the prisoners being killed in our prison because UConn has an unchecked health care, no big contract for 20 years. I want to know where the Democrats were. Where did they stand up when the people of Griswold were getting a gun range forced on them? They're nowhere. So if you want to talk about standing up or rising up, I'll go stand up and rise up for the people of Connecticut, that's for sure. Um, Mr. Satchel. I wish at some point we had had a chance to exchange phone numbers so that if anybody had said anything about your children or made you feel uncomfortable in that way, you would have called me and I would have been able to, to find out if that was the situation and, and I would have dealt with it. We don't need that in politics anymore and, and, and I think we need to, to, to move past that. But I do, I, I, I think the question is important. I think it is important to speak out when the leader of your party uh, is talking about uh, the, the, equating the peace protesters with white supremacists in Charlottesville. I think it's important to speak out when the, 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 the leader of your party is um, saying things on, a, on, a, on, a, on the Billy Bush bus. Um, I think it's important that we make our, we, we need to, this is values. You need to know the values of the candidate. And the candidate, candidate needs to express those and say, this is what I believe in. The Whiting Lake Forensic, that ended up being, and I'm not sure what my opponent is referring to, but that ended up having bipartisan legislation passing 36 to zero, addressing that situation and, 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 and dealing with it. Um, there, were, there were 10 arrests, 36 people, 37 were put on administrative leave, and 36 ended up um, being fired. So there was bipartisan work on that. To that was a horrendous situation, and there was bipartisan work to deal with it, and hopefully it's an example of how we can behave moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Senator Summers? Yes, as far as Wayne Forensic, um, my opponent could be wronger. I had to, I mean, could be more wrong, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not it tonight. So, I had to stand up and demand a public hearing. There was not one Democrat that was coming by my side. They were told by the governor to stand down. Yes, eventually, because I can build consensus on both sides, it did pass unanimously out of both houses. And I had a Democrat stand up and say it was the most important bill that passed last legislative session due to my work. Um, and how dare you question my ethics and morality. I am a woman, I've always stood for women. I will stand up for women, right. and I am focused Next on question. the state of Connecticut not what the president's doing. Next question. Mr. Sachin, um, uh, 
U Sports so installing electronic tolls on Connecticut highways. Uh, if so, why? If not, how would you propose paying for the state's transportation needs? We begin with this attention. Sure, and I, I, you know, it comes down to other people's money. 35% of the people driving on uh, our roads are from other states, and they're using our, our roads, they're benefiting from them, um, and they should pay their fair share. Um, I think that also, you know, we pay eight bucks to get into to, to Boston to go to a Fenway game. We pay, you know, twelve bucks to get into um, into into Manhattan. Um, we need to, you know, it's only fair. We're the, there's only two, one other state on the Eastern Seaboard, Vermont, that doesn't have tolls. Um, there's only ten in the country that doesn't have tolls. We need to build our infrastructure. When you hear and when you hear why GE. Um, relocated 2,200 um, of its 800 workers to Boston. One of the reasons that they put forth was that our infrastructure was crumbling and, and didn't support them as a, as a global company. We need to address it. Um, tolls is a reasonable approach um, to doing that. It should at least be explored um, in some manner. Thank you. Um, Senator Summers. Well, now Mr. Sexton is saying it should be explored. Previously, he said he was all in for tolls. I am not in for tolls, and I'll tell you why. They don't make financial sense. Every state has a different deal with the federal government. Our deal in, in Connecticut is if we put tolls on the road at the beginning or the exit of Connecticut, we have to pay back all the federal dollars since 1984. That's $200 million a year. It's $6 billion. Somebody can tell me where we're going to get that money. So the option is to bring the tolls in. You, have a, you will have a toll every four miles on every road. The cost that they're looking at, the average cost in the United States is four cents a mile. In Connecticut, we're looking at 10 cents going to 32 cents. Plus, if we add tolls, we get a large reduction in the gas tax that we get right now. For every dollar we spend, we get 70 cents back from the federal government. You put tolls on the road, you get 20 cents back. It doesn't make financial sense. There's plenty of money. We've generated $2 billion in gas tax. It just, the legislature never puts it into the special transportation fund. So they say, there's no money in the special transportation fund. It's like saying I have no money in my bank account because I never put my paycheck in. Let's be realistic. That fund has been rated. I shouldn't say rated because it was never put it in. It's been diverted, that's a better word, into the general fund for years and years and years. We need to have a legislature that has the discipline to deposit the money for what it's used for into the account. Now we're going to charge people out of state more. 80% of the people on the roads are Connecticut residents. If I have somebody who lives in Griswold and they work at Electric Boat, they will spend $3,400 a year in tolls. It doesn't make sense. Our people can't afford it. Mr. Stad, you get the last word on this question, 30 seconds. Yeah, I don't believe the federal numbers are accurate. How are all the other states on the eastern seaboard able to do this and be able to support their infrastructure um, to do that? It, it simply isn't isn't accurate, and it's a fear tactic um, to to go against a, a policy. Also, the gas tax to rely upon the gas tax as fuel efficiency increases um, so dramatically um, is irresponsible. And we need to focus on real solutions um, that can and does have the opportunity to generate revenue so that we can build up our infrastructure and support our businesses. Thank you. Uh, next question, and it's to Senator Summers uh, from one of our readers. What could be done and what have you done to keep retirees from leaving Connecticut and taking their income and lifetime savings with them? Thank you for that question. You know, in a, in a decorum that we had maybe a few weeks ago, my opponent said that people were coming to Connecticut, and he couldn't be more wrong. We are losing population left and right, 65 and older and under 30. What we've done under the Republican budget that we heard from Mr. Sachin is so horrible is that we have been able to provide tax relief for those who are retired. If you are 65 and retired, you will no longer be paying Connecticut state tax on your Social Security, and we have a plan to phase out the tax on pensions over the next six years. That's significant for those who are on a fixed income. It's just the beginning. We understand that we need to keep those folks here in Connecticut. Mr. Sachin also says millionaires are coming, those wealth that are wealthier here. I can tell you, 11 years ago, the top 15 taxpayers contributed $650 million to the state coffers. Four years ago, it was $497 million. Two years ago, it was $222 million. What that tells you is the ones that are wealthy have the ability to leave, and they are. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Sachin. I think one of the reasons 90% of incumbents get reelected is because they're able to stand up and pick and choose 
the items that occurred in the previous legislature and say that they were responsible for them. That Social Security tax break is great, um, and it's a and it's an economic driver, and I hope it extends to um, and I hope it extends to pensions because that is a drive that is a, it's, it's a great policy. But it wasn't a Republican initiative, and it wouldn't have passed in a Republican legislature, and, and I think we, we know that. Um, regarding migration, people, we, there are problems, okay, but, but you don't just throw generalities. You try to find real solutions. We are losing retirees 65 and above. We're losing millennials. Let's find solutions on that. Um, and we're also losing 18 to 21. But we are increasing the people from 30 to 64. That's a positive thing. We're also increasing the people from zero to, to 17. So we have these people who are moving here with their children. That's a positive development. Let's stop hating on Connecticut. Connecticut has positive things. We have problems, we have issues we need to solve. We have economic issues that we need to solve. We shouldn't be finger pointing and saying, because there's a lot of historical blame to go around. But the bottom line is we need to stop hating on Connecticut. This is a good place to live. This is a good place to raise your family. Um, and we need to put policies in place that encourage our students to stay, our 18 to 21 year olds to stay, and our millennials to stay. And I hope we get a chance to, to talk about some of those policies as well. Thank you. Um, Senator something you another 30 seconds to wrap up. Yes, it's easy for someone to say my numbers are wrong. He needs to look them up. My numbers are absolutely factual and correct. And he wasn't in on the budget negotiations, so I don't know how we can say it wasn't a Republican initiative. It was 100% a Republican initiative to roll out, back those taxes. The Democrat initiative was to raise taxes once again. So let's just be clear on that. As far as um, losing population for those millennials, I agree with that. That's why we put in workforce investment. We want to see apprenticeship programs in the high schools so those graduating from high school have the ability to have a school when they graduate. Um, you guys anticipated my next question so we can expand on it, which was, uh, what, what, what must Connecticut do to stop the brain drain of uh, high highly educated millennials uh, out of the state that we are witnessing. And first crack of that is Mr. Satch. Sure, and again, that's that's the issue, and that's that's where we really, really need to focus. And I would say that, again, looking back at that Republican budget of September 2017, that cut to education, um, to, to UConn, which, which had the possibility of closing Avery Point just up the road, um, and caused significant um, concern. That's not how you keep Millennials here. It, the, the Republican budget of 2017 would have cut 15,000 scholarships. 15,000 scholarships. 15,000 of our students who would not have been able to come here and study, um, and probably would have looked elsewhere. That's not responsible. We need to encourage them. Another way to do it would be dealing with their student debt. Is there a way? If you come to school in Connecticut and you stay here, we can help with your debt. Um, would we? Could we do it if they have federal loans, which we don't have control over? If you move to Connecticut and you work here and you're a millennial, why don't we give you a tax break um, so that you can pay your student debt? So for those, for 22 to 29, you have the opportunity to have a tax deduction um, or a tax credit um, to encourage you to stay and make it affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 90 seconds, uh, Senator Summers. Yes, uh, the Republican budget did cut UConn 6%, and it also cut UConn Medical Center 6%. UConn gets two billion dollars from the state payer, from the uh, state taxpayers. Most other flagship universities get about 21 percent of their funding from the state. UConn gets 38 percent from the state of Connecticut and has the highest administration costs in the nation. When you talk about UConn, we have called for a full audit because of a few things. Number one, UConn continued to pay a professor for eight months before they realized that he had been killed by his wife in his home. Nobody noticed he didn't show up. No, none of his work had been submitted. No one cared, no one noticed. UConn had a $140 million no bid contract to take care of the health care in our prisons. We have 25 people dying in prison right now of curable diseases because of the health care that was delivered to them. Just last week, we read about a, another professor who took $100,000 in travel trips, unfettered, unchecked. UConn took a 6% cut, that's true. But other agencies took just as much. When we have a financial situation that we have here in the state of Connecticut, caused by eight years of failed policies, everyone has to tighten their belt. That's as far as UConn goes. But what we need to do is make sure that our students, we have proposed apprenticeship programs. We have proposed, I had a proposal in 
for high tech STEM and medical students to come here. If they came here and they worked in Connecticut, if they worked in our school-based health clinics, we would pay their loan back. Uh, Mr. Statue, you have another 30 seconds on this topic. So 1990 state funding for UConn was at 44%. Now it's at 26%. Um, that's a significant drop. Um, and that's when you hear about tuition going up and people not being able to afford school. That's the reason because Connecticut has stopped supporting it at the level it should. We need to support, we can't cut 15,000 scholarships from a program. And there was significant concerns as to the satellites, whether any of the satellites would be able to survive based on the cuts. We need to do responsible things to keep the millennials here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Can I get my turn, right? Uh, I'll give you another 30 seconds, uh, and, and Mr. Stafford, please. Uh, it's on the mic. He made some specific, I'll give both another 30 seconds to respond, and we'll move on. Yeah, do it. No, no. I'm going. It's not my turn. It would not be. Okay, I don't have to say anything. Okay. Next question is to you, uh, uh, Senator Summers. Do you consider phasing out the state income tax to be a worthy and realistic goal, uh, as proposed by Bob Stefanowski, the Republican candidate for governor? I'm going to answer the former question. As far as UConn, the tuition has gone up even when the state has given them given them more money. As far as closing Avery Point, that was a stint by the governor. I actually talked to the president of Avery Point. He called people up and said, hey, you want to come down here? We're going to make an issue out of this. Avery Point was never going to close. I have been an advocate for dorms at Avery Point since I ran for lieutenant governor, by the way. Um, Avery Point, in order to close any satellite, cam satellite campus, would have to go through the process of the legislature. So that's just plain fear tactics. As far as phasing out the income tax, I think it's a nice idea. I don't think it's something that can be done in the near foreseeable future, but anytime we can give a reduction in the income tax for the people that are paying it, I think that's a positive thing. If we can reduce what people are paying in income tax and try to make up the revenue in some other place, it puts more money in your pocket and it helps people be able to afford the high cost of living here in Connecticut. Uh, Mr. Statue, the question uh, is uh, the proposal to phase out the income tax. And again, I, I, I I appreciate that Senator Summers recognizes the folly in, in candidate Stefanowski's proposal, um, but I think it, it does present, it's a values question, and, and I think it's an integrity question. Everybody's kind of, he, he gets to get up and, and make these on behalf of the Republican Party in Connecticut and say that he's going to cut the income tax, and he's doing it to get votes when he and everyone else knows it's simply not possible. You can't take a $20 billion budget and reduce it by $11 billion. It's, it's not possible, and it's insulting to the voters. It's insulting to the people who live in this state and, and, are, and, are, and, are, and are using health care and are, rely on the education. Municipal property taxes, your property taxes, will double under that plan. And the answer of, oh, don't worry, he, did, he doesn't really mean it, that's insulting. And, and we, as a, we as a community, we as a state, are better than that. We should be talking about real solutions, real possibilities. Can we reduce the property tax? Can we stimulate? I believe. I don't believe in trickle-down economics. I believe in trickle-up economics. If we want to talk about tax cuts for the middle class and find ways to make sure to, to do that, those are the dollars that will be reinvested into our economy. Um, further tax cuts for retirees, again, dollars that will be reinvested into our economy rather than tax cuts for the rich, which will which will not come back into to our economy. Thank you. Uh, now you get another 30 seconds okay. on, this, on this question. Okay. Um, Mr. Sachin wants to talk about values. Does anybody remember in 2014 when Governor Malloy ran and he said there was no deficit? And then two days after he was elected, all of a sudden there was this deficit? So let's talk about the reality. Mr. Lamont, who's running for governor, his idea of um, tax reduction for the middle class is a $200 property tax credit off of your income tax. That's his idea. You'd be better off doing something completely different than that. So when we're talking about values, Mr. Lamont and Statchin, they want to raise taxes on tolls. Every Thank middle you. class person here is going to feel that. Thank so you. that's not the direction to go. This is Statchin. Now next question, what is your position on a $15 minimum wage? 
I support a uh, livable wage for workers in Connecticut, and I think, again, I think it's an economic driver, just like the, the, the Commission on Fiscal, Response, Fiscal Growth found that, that, that that is a way to drive growth. And, and Massachusetts has a program, they're going to hit 15 by 2023. Rhode Island's going to hit 15, New York's going to hit 15. We talk about migration, we talk about losing people. If we don't keep up, we did good. We got up to 10-10 before the curve, um, and that was a few years ago. But we've fallen behind that. We're behind the curve. Other states are offering more. We need to provide livable wages. We need to provide wages so that our people can live in dignity, can have one job. The, the thing with the $15 minimum wage, we need to look and see how it impacts the, the, the Walmarts and the big boxes and how they're able to take advantage of the low minimum wage by using our state resources to provide benefits to their employees. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Summers? Yes, I think the $15 an hour minimum wage is a noble idea, but I think this is the absolute wrong time to do it. When you're, you're referring to other states, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island, they are in a much better financial situation than the state of Connecticut. If you talk to any businesses, like I have, small businesses, $15 an hour minimum wage, they will lay people off, they will go to part-time, they cannot afford it. And as a municipal leader with experience, many of our jobs are indexed on the minimum wage. So you instantly add large costs to the town of Rotten, where paraprofessionals are indexed on the minimum wage. Where are you going to go to make that up? You're going to go to the property tax owner, or you're going to have to lay off those paras. I think it's something that we need to look at, and I think everybody here needs to understand that every single budget cycle, the Republicans have offered to move the minimum wage based on the CPI index. And every time, the Democrats have rejected it. Why? We have it on tape, because the Progressive Party wants to be able to talk about it because it's a good political talking point. That's why. Um, Mr. Statue, if you could maybe address in your final comments uh, the idea of indexing. You have, you have 30 seconds. Right. I, think, I think indexing is something to think about for the future. I think if we index when the minimum wage came in earlier, it would have, you know, I think we'd be at like $23 right now. So I think indexing is important, but let's talk short term. Let's talk about what we can accomplish in the short term. We need to set up over a five year period to get people to a minimum wage. And, and I think to say that we can't do that in Connecticut, we can do that in Connecticut. And there's workers, it's a, a, many small businesses are, are already paying that. But the bottom line is, how can we expect to compete in this region, and how can we expect to keep people if we don't pay a livable wage? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question to Senator Summers. Uh, would you support making paid family leave mandatory? Uh, if so, how would it be paid for? That's a question I've been asking. How are we going to pay for this? Again, fa paid family leave is a no idea. It's something that I think all of us would want, but we don't have the resources to pay for that in the state of Connecticut. What's been offered so far has been a payroll deduction, another, another payroll deduction that employers and individuals have to pay, whether they would ever use the paid family leave or not. I think it's something that we should discuss. That bill never came up for discussion. It never came up to, for a vote in, in the Senate or the House, I believe, last year. I have an idea and a proposal that we put forward that you could create a family leave um, I guess it would be considered close to an HSA that you could carry with you as an employee. You start with it, you develop it, you can put money into it out of your um, out of your paycheck. If your employer matches it, they would get a tax deduction and it would travel with you like a 401k. If you never use it, you could convert it over to an HSA. Those are things that we're looking for. But to just arbitrarily say, we're going to have paid family leave in the state of Connecticut when we are in financial dire straits does not make sense at this time. And we're going to hear every other state Thank does you. it, but we're the bottom of the barrel. Thank we you. cannot do it at this point. Uh, Mr. Statue. We can do it. <laughs> we can do it. Um, you know, and, and we've got to stop saying that Connecticut can't do it. Connecticut can do it. We can have a livable wage for our workers. We can have health care programs in place for our workers. And we can have a paid family leave, or an earned uh, family leave to allow for that. One in four women have to return to work within two weeks of having their children because they, because of, for financial reasons. We are falling behind. 38% of millennials say they would move out of the country, not just saying, not just the state, they move out of the country if they could find somewhere that was more family friendly. We can find these solutions and, and this constant refrain of, 
can't do it, we can't do it. Let's find solutions. I think it's interesting. You know, Senator Summers threw out a, a, an idea. Why don't we, you know, try to, that, that's a starting point. Let's talk about these. But we have to get on board, because Rhode Island has it, Massachusetts has it, New York has it. We're back to the issue of hemorrhaging workers. And if we don't start to say, yes, these are values, these are the policies that we believe in, and that we're going to support because we want families to be strong. We want families to be to be able to, to care for each other when a family member is sick, and we want to provide the resources to do it. California, New Jersey, New all these places are able to do this. New Jersey, New Jersey has tough financial problems. They found a way to do it. And the history of all these programs in these states, all these programs it result in surpluses. They, the, the program actually generates, provides its need. There's history, there's precedent out there that we can follow. We can do it in Connecticut. Thank you. Another 30 seconds? Sure. Seconds. I'd like to know how we're going to no, do it and how Mr. Satchin's going to pay for it. Because I have people in my district, in Griswold, in Plainfield, in Groton, that are retired and working a second job just to make the payments on their, on their property taxes or the taxes to the state of Connecticut. So they're working and they're going to be paying into a family leave that they don't want. I don't think it should be mandatory. Absolutely not. We can't put another burden and mandate on our businesses that are already leaving. That's the wrong way to go. If we want to explore a program like I just explained, that is optional, absolutely. But you can't mandate. Mandates have pushed businesses and people out of state of Connecticut. And $15 an hour is not a livable wage, by the way. It's an entree into the market. We need to be concerned about the maximum wage. Thank the way you. that we do that is through education and providing Thank opportunities. Mr. Sajjan, um, would you have supported the final version of the bump stock bill, which Senator Summers said she opposed on constitutional grounds? Uh, why or why not? Yes, yeah. yes, I would have, I would have supported it, and I think the, you know, the safety of our children, the safety of the public safety, I think is paramount. And when you have law enforcement, including the mayor of, of the, the the chief of police of Groton. Um, testifying before the legislature saying this is an important public safety issue and we need to make sure that these bump stocks are not available. We need to listen. Um, we need to listen to that. Um, listen, I'm, I'm not a pacifist when it comes to weapons. I've been 26 years in the military. Um, I've been issued a firearm. I've carried it into combat zones. I, you know, but we need common sense rules. This was one of them and that's why it passed uh, by, by a large amount. The idea that, it, and, and I know my Senator Summers said that it was an unlawful taking under the 15th Amendment, and I would just ask if there is one Supreme Court case that supports that, because I looked for it. It's a novel theory. It's a novel constitutional theory that jeopardized the safety of our children, and, and I will always go with the side of law enforcement and the safety of our children. Thank you. Uh, Senator Summers? Okay, well, first of all, Mr. Satchin, of course, is inflaming the bill. I did vote for a bump stock bill, one that was constitutional and one that follows our current gun laws that were created after Sandy Hook. It's exactly the same. The reason the gun laws in Sandy Hook were created the way they were, which was basically, if you had it in your possession, you kept it, you registered it with the state police, is because they were concerned about the illegal taking. And it's not Article 15, by the way. You should know that you're an attorney. So as we move forward, um, one of the things he also left out, yes, the, the town of Groton police chief testified on bump stocks. That's true. And I did vote for a bump stock bill. The city of Groton police chief also talked to us about mental health and about the importance for school resource officers. What Mr. Satchin has refused to tell anyone is that there was two amendments put in that I supported. One of them was to reduce the grants that we used to run for office and to put it into, pool, into a pool. So any municipality that wanted to have safety resource officers had an ability to apply for that money. It wouldn't come out of the police budget. It wouldn't come out of the education budget. In addition, I was a proponent to put a mental health worker in every school-based health clinic where we can identify those that may have issues early on so they don't become greater issues as the, as, the, as the child grows. There's nobody more concerned about school safety than I am. And I just will leave you with this. If the Democrats were so concerned about school safety, why did they eliminate the position in DEST and DAS that oversees school safety plans? They got rid of that position. That shows you how sincere they um, are about school safety. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Summers went over quite a bit. 45 seconds on the final response, just to be fair, balance it out, 845. Uh, 
Uh, last word on this one, Mr. Satcher. Sure. You know, at the end of the day, she did not vote for the bill. Um, and to say, well, I voted for a prior one, but not this one. Why wouldn't you vote for this bill? Um, and again, to put forth, and I apologize if it was a, I, the Fifth Amendment is where the takings clause in the Bill of Rights, and if it's Article 15, I apologize. But, but the point is, you know, that's a novel theory of constitutional law that really doesn't have any, any support or precedent. And to, to throw that novel theory out and attempt to, to say that that's the reason, I don't know the reason, is it to make sure that the, the NRA continues her rating? Um, what, is the, what is the reason um, for not supporting our children and the wishes of law enforcement? Um, after marching in Stonington as well, which I know many of the students found hypocritical. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Summers, uh, I think you started to raise this in the last exchange. Um, should Connecticut continue with the Citizens Election Program that provides public funding of state campaigns? And if you want to retain the program, would you propose any changes to it? Yes, I just want to address that it wasn't a novel theory of constitutional law. It's exactly the theory that was used for the Sandy Hook gun laws that were passed. I didn't vote for the last version of the bump stock bill because it's not constitutional. That's why. The one before it followed the current gun laws. The question should be, why didn't the Democrats vote for that? That's the question. Secondly, it is the senator's job to attend things and listen. And that's exactly what I did with the March for Your Lives in Stonington. As far as the Citizens Election Program, I think the grants are way too high. I think that the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor grants should be together. I don't think they should be separated. We've seen with so many candidates that are running for office, millions of taxpayer dollars being spent on campaigns. I would like to see the grants reduced. They could be in half that, as compared to what they are now, and candidates would still have access to run. You can certainly make rules so that, as we are now, we can't take from any lobbyists, or at least I didn't, any outside That's groups, inside. et cetera. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Satchin, uh, Citizens Election Program uh, questions whether you support it, uh, and if you do support it, do you propose any changes to it? I, I do support it, and I wouldn't be sitting here without it. Um, I, I, and I and I find it again somewhat concerning that someone who continually lobbies against a program and says that it's an indication of government abuse consistently uses the program. Um, if you'd like to give the money back, then that would that would be that would be admirable. Um, and say, or not participate in it. Say, I don't believe in this program, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to participate in it. Um, but that's not what happens. She rallies against it, but then she takes them on the end. And again, I, I think that's, that's a, a reflection um, that is of concern. The Citizens Election Program is a crown jewel in Connecticut. It costs, it costs 1.5 million floor to run a state senate campaign in Pennsylvania. It costs a million dollars that they have to raise to run a senate campaign in California, and that's what, what people have told me. And, and I wouldn't be here. Um, and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of your neighbors who wouldn't be here. It would be a completely different game if Connecticut had that. And that's why we have the program. There's bumps and bruises to it. It's not perfect. It could be improved. They could look at ways to make sure that, that other funds aren't able to come in. I, I would support that. But overall, that is a program that's getting more of your neighbors and your friends and your family running for office and trying to do the right thing because Connecticut has this. And I've, I've spoken with people in Massachusetts when I explain it to them, and they're like, wow, what a, what a fantastic program. Something, again, for Connecticut to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because it began with you, you get another 30 seconds. Sure. Well, there we go again, distorting what I said. I never said I wanted to get rid of the program. Did anyone hear me say that? What I said is we could look at reducing the grants so they don't cost as much. We don't need as much money as we're all getting to run for office. But because we're all getting that much, that's how much is spent. That's what I said. There are very, there's large loopholes within this program, and we saw this the last time the governor was elected when he spent money coming up from a federal account to help his campaign. The SEC, that is the body that oversees the CEP, is understaffed. They can't handle complaints, and so we do need to look at it. But I never said eliminate it. I said look at reducing the grants. So I, I, think, I don't think that's lobbying against the program. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stachin, next question to you. Do you support the legalization of marijuana for use by adults 21 and older? So that, that's a, a 
tough one in some respects. Um, I, I enlisted in the Air Force when I was 18 in the Air Force ROTC program, and ever since then I've been drug tested, and, and so that hasn't been a part of my life um, on there. That being said, I think we are at a place where, and I've prosecuted people in the Air Force as, 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 a, as a jab, um, I've prosecuted people who both use drugs and trafficked in drugs, so um, but we've, the culture has changed. Um, and we have progressed in, in, in this way. And my concern is if we have, again, if we have Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts, all around us as places where marijuana is legal, and I in Canada as well now that they, they've legalized recreational marijuana, um, that that creates uh, an incentive for our, our children and our family members to go across state lines and do that. Would I have been leading a charge in Connecticut to legalize marijuana as the first state to do that? That wouldn't have been my battle. Um, but I'm also a realist. I look where we are now, and I realize what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Summers. Yes, um, as the chair of public health, this came to our committee. And uh, we heard testimony until 3 AM concerning the legalization of marijuana. Uh, most of the people that testified were actually um, medicinal users that had problems with access, and the cost was very high. I would like to see us focus on allowing farmers to grow hemp before we legalize marijuana. Up north, that would really help a lot of our farmers. Um, as far as the uh, studies, I know Mr. Stachin says he's a data guy. Well, if you look at the data um, of what marijuana does to the adolescent brain, it's very scary. Um, it can induce schizophrenia. There are a lot of really significant side effects. So I think that if we're going to proceed, we have to proceed with, with great caution. The other states that have legalized it have issues in the way that it's distributed. We would need to make sure that the distribution models are correct, accurate, and that you can you have a way to be able to um, actually uh, trace the material. Um, my, I, my, I'm concerned that people that have a medicinal card would not be able to find the supply that they need. But just let me caution you, the only reason we're having this conversation in the state of Connecticut and probably throughout the other states is because of the revenue. So let me just remind you of a few things as far as revenue. We were promised the lottery was going to go to education, the gas tax was going to go into you know, the transportation fund, the casino money was coming back to us, and the income tax was going to be phased out. I'm very leery when we hear about all this revenue is going to be the Valhalla for the state of Connecticut. So I'm saying that I think it's going to happen, but we have to proceed with caution. All right, thank you. Uh, 30 more seconds on this topic. Of all the questions, I think we could certainly find common ground um, on this issue, which I, I think we should always be trying to do. I agree with the medicinal, and one of the issues with the medicinal is that the VA is not able to provide medicinal marijuana to veterans, um, which is a big problem. I also believe that 21 years should be the minimum to, to be able to do that, to address some of the issues um, regarding adolescent development. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I also agree that the revenue stream, I don't look at it as a revenue stream in any way, and I don't think we should count on it, because I do think that during the transition period over the next few years, there will be social issues that the revenue is going to be required to use that were unanticipated. Thank you. Um, good time for one more question before we get to closing statements. Um, uh, and it's to Senator Summers. Uh, certainly a big social and health issue for our region and for, and for the country uh, has been the op opioid crisis. Is, is the state doing enough to address this crisis in our communities and what further might you pursue if uh, re-elected? Thank you for that question. Uh, and again, that question actually really needs more than 60 seconds. but. As the Chair of Public Health, I can tell you that I was um, involved in passing landmark legislation concerning opiates. Um, no state is doing enough. The country is not doing enough. It is the epidemic of our lifetime. Some of the things that we were able to do in uh, public health uh, that really didn't get much coverage even from your paper that are significant are things like when you are entered into rehab, the rehab facility right now is based on an alcohol model that doesn't work for opiates. So basically you have to be dirty to come in and clean and to go into detox. We've changed that in the law. So it is up now to the doctor to decide whether a patient needs to be treated in the hospital or not. And the insurance companies are required to pay. We made physicians be able to um, write scripts electronically. We have a portal on the public health uh, website so that we know when a bed is available. We made Narcan available for anyone on demand, but it's not enough. 
We need to stop the source coming into our country, and we need to figure out why so many young people, and it's not any longer, it's moved past this idea of prescription drugs. It's moved on from that. Uh, we'll get another 30 seconds, so at least uh, you'll get, you get that rebuttal. Um, 90 seconds on this topic. So I think, I think the, the past legislature did do a good job in addressing some of the issues in regarding um, access to opioids, reducing the amount of prescriptions, reducing the, um, the, the number that are allowed to be given any time. So I think there were some positive steps, um, but I think there's more to be done. One, and I know um, uh, Attorney Wong is looking into um, looking at investigating the pharmaceuticals and the pharmaceutical benefit managers um, to see how this occurred and finding out what occurred that allowed such rampant um, such rampant uh, uh, prescriptions to be issued and I think an investigation is going to be crucial on that. I think one of the biggest issues that the next legislature is going to have to address is treatment. Um, there aren't enough beds. Um, we do have this public health issue and there aren't enough beds to care for, for our neighbors and our families and friends who, who, are, who are suffering from this. Um, and, and again, my concern, that's the expensive one. It's one thing to say, okay, you can't give a prescription for more than five pills um, and you can only give over a period of time. The hard part, the expensive part, is going to be finding the beds. Um, and again, I would, I would look back to if we're going to cut $11 billion from our general fund, how are we going to pay for that? Because it's crucial and we need to do it and we need a responsible plan that's going to look at how we can address this, how we can investigate what happened um, and take the appropriate action but then how can we also ensure that there is treatment available um, for the people who are suffering from this? Thank you. And, and did you get another 30 seconds? Uh, okay, well, we're not going to solve the opioid crisis in 30 seconds, no, but I can not. tell you that um, it is well known what happened by Purdue Pharma. Um, and um, it has to do with the pain lobbying groups. It has to do with how physicians were instructed how to address pain. That has changed in the medical schools right now. Um, as far as treatment beds, I'm glad you said that because when I had a direct conversation with the Demas Commissioner, she said there's plenty of beds available. And we all know that's not true. That's why we instituted a 24-hour real-time bed availability on the public health website because we had clinicians spending hours trying to find a bed for someone. Availability of beds, and let me just be clear, there is no way we're cutting $11 billion from the state budget. I'm tired of hearing that from my opponent. I've said I don't support it. Let's move on. To be fair, thank you. Um, so now we go to closing statements, and we have coin flip to start. And uh, uh, Mr. Statchin gets to go first. You have a minute to uh, wrap up. Great, thank you. I'm running for state senate because I love Connecticut, and I think we can make it a lot better. I began this evening by talking about trust and choices and values, and, and I hope that our debate here tonight helped you make your choice clearer. If you choose me, I will build an economy that recognizes that Connecticut has an incredible opportunity to grow and prosper. And I will, work to help to, I will work to help build up the manufacturing industry, tourism, retail, local health facilities to do that. Go to my website, statchin2018.com, and read my ideas. And, and go to my opponent's website. Read your ideas. Compare. Because you have a very important decision to make. Um, the reason I continue to mention that $11 billion cut to a $20 billion general fund is because that could happen um, based on this vote with an 18 to 18 Senate. We lose the Senate and we lose the, the governorship, we could be facing that. And all of these proposals with health care and education, all of them will, will, will go away. Thank um, you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Senator Summers. Thank you. Um, it's been an honor to be here tonight. I'd like to say that for the first time in, since 1893, this, the Senate has been split 18 and 18, and we have done some miraculous things. We've been able to deliver a budget without tax increases and actually provide tax reductions for many in our state, along with making sure that services for the disabled, for great crisis, for dare, care for kids is all fully funded. I want to say this. Um, I am somebody who has challenged the status quo. I've delivered results for this district. When we were looking at unprecedented cuts here in Groton to our education system, I stood up, I fought Malloy, and we were re reinstated. With this campaign, we have seen the vitriol, the anger, and the hate associated with a push to the left and a push to the right. I have practiced and thought about what I was taught right here in the halls of Robert E. Fitch and from my parents. And that's always to do the morally right thing, even when it's not the easy thing. 
And I just want to leave you with this. When I was faced with the knowledge of unimaginable abuse at Whiting Forensic, the unethical stealing of ratepayer dollars at CMAC, prisoners, I will, the prisoners dying in our prison system from a Yukon unchecked contract, and people in Griswold yeah, having to. their hands taken away, I stood up and challenged the people are going to have to go to the five that concludes our debate. I thank our audience at Fitch Senior High School and uh, our audience watching on thedate.com and wish everyone a good night. And you can applaud now. So